isn't available now. That's a good, good sign. Ah, there we go. Okay, I think we got it. All right, let me exit out of this. All right. Okay, well, I tried broadcasting on YouTube first a few minutes early just because I've been having problems, but we got the, we kind of sort of had the same problem again. Had to exit out, kind of end it, recreate it, and go back in. So anyway, so now that it's working on YouTube, I turned on uh, the regular site and um, um, Facebook also, so we should be set for that. Okay, looks like everybody's seeing me. Okay. All right. Uh, tonight, what we wanted to do is look just at one, kind of answer one question. And if we go to our Bible Facts home site and go to the DSS calendar, you can see that according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is the year 5946. And according to modern Judaism, the modern Jewish calendar, it's 5782. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the question is, what happened to this 160 some years? Why why do we have a calendar that's 57, 82, and 59, 46? Well, actually, that's answered in an ancient document. Now, this is interesting to me because just like you could have, make sure everything's working. Okay, uh, just like you might have a Pharisee document tweak it to sound Pharisee, or maybe even a, an Essene document, tweak the stuff to make it look uh, in their favor. We're not sure who wrote this, but there is a book called The Seder Olam. And now that I think about it, it seems more Essene than Pharisee, but what it does is it goes through the years, uh, kind of like I did on, uh, well, I did a translation of The Seder Olam, but like I did in the ancient post-flood history, just trying to figure out piece by piece, add up the years, uh, that kind of thing. And so what happens is it ends up saying Messiah came and everything was fulfilled, and then someone changed the story. The interesting thing about it, though, is that the Talmud itself, to calculate its uh, timetable, which is 5782, quotes the Seder Olam as an accurate historical source. And the last chapter has been so heavily edited, we're not sure what was really there in the beginning. Just the last chapter. So I want to take you to that tonight and kind of show you uh, how that works. Oh, Diane said she liked my message the other day. Yeah, Pastor Rick has been in the hospital for about a week. He was supposed to get out today. I haven't heard, Just looking to see if he did say something. I haven't heard if he's got out or not. But he was feeling better, doing better, and he wanted to thank everyone for their prayers. And hopefully he'll be out soon. So I filled in this last week, and we talked about uh, some of the stuff we're, we're going to be talking about in the next couple of weeks. Um, uh, Matthew 23 and the community, or the um, Damascus Covenant. So, but thank you for that. So let's look at this. This, this Seder Alam is an accurate historical book, book of history put together by some Jewish guy about 160 AD. So if you think about what happened, you've had the apostasy, you've had the Pharisees and Sadducees come to be, they've been obliterated, no longer in control of Israel, and start making their what would become Orthodox Judaism later. Um, they start tweaking things. Hillel the third, 100 years from then, will actually, or 150 or so, We'll come out with the Hillel calendar, which is the calendar that we use now, which would say today is Tishrei 15, 5782, um, Israeli standard time, that is. And so this is what's happening. So about 169, 170, something like that, about 100 years after the destruction of the temple, a guy sets down to write what actually happened. And it's really amazing. So let's hop to that here. This is our translation of the ancient Seder Olam. And as you know me, I just take the regular titles, put ancient in front of them, and you'll know it's 
my translation or my commentary or something. So it's a 2000 year old scroll. And let's just look at this here. This is well, how he done it or how we break it up. He, he talks about creation to Jacob as one set of time. It's not onus or ages or anything. He's just calculating the years. So can we start at creation and go to here and add up the years, go to the next phase, add up the years and come up with a total? It's just a history book. That's what the person's trying to do. What's interesting is you look at this, you read something like Genesis or the um, book of Jasher, and it just says this was 20 years from that period. It's, it's not trying to prove it. It's like, this is the written record. It was 20 years. We're done. Whereas a lot of the, the, this guy and a lot of the Pharisees and other groups will try to prove it by quoting things. This rabbi said, this scripture said, etc. And when you're not there and not an eyewitness, that's a good way to do it. Um, but what's interesting, remember, it says in the scriptures that Jesus taught as one having authority, not as the scribes. So if I was there and I said it started on my 12th birthday, and when I was 32 years old, it finally finished, I know, I know I was there. It took exactly 20 years. You know, so it's that kind of a thing, as opposed to, well, Ken said this, Ralph said this, Bob said this. So I think it's probably like this. So that's the kind of thing that we're doing. So this doesn't have authority on its own. It's just a guy trying to figure everything out just from the scripture, just from the Old Testament. Until he gets to a problem case where you're not sure how things work. And then he's going to try to quote from the rabbis or extra Jewish history or try to explain the maybe the, the overlaps of the kings or things like that. So we just want to look at how this goes. So creation to Jacob is the first chapter. And then Jacob, how he splits up the, the kingdom. And, you know, he has um, his 12 sons and Judah starts the kings. And they're going to have different lines going through. And then from the covenant that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then his sons, from the time of the covenant to the slavery. Okay. Then he kind of backs up at this point and, and talks about Noah's flood and tries to get... Um, uh, timelines with that and then the burning bush and Mount Sinai so we finally get to uh, all the preparations at the time of the exodus and the delivering of the law then you have Mount Sinai and there's the tabernacle book of numbers 40th year when they finally enter death of Moses and Joshua so this is the first section and then they have a we have a chart in here for this stuff too but you have the judges chart and then you have the time of the judges. He adds all those up. Samuel, Saul, David. Um, David and Solomon, their reigns. Just briefly trying to make sure the numbers match in the basic events. And then the divided kingdom, Rehoboam, all the way down to Zedekiah. And then we talk about Ezekiel, the 390 years, how that stuff figures in. Uh, the fall of Jerusalem, Daniel, and then Ezra and Esther. So the time of the return from Babylon. And then the last chapter is from Nehemiah, Nehemiah and Ezra, the return, from that return to the end of the second temple. At least that's what the current title says. And like I say, this has been heavily rewritten. And so what the, what the uh, Talmud is going to say is this is an accurate history, and this last chapter basically explains it all. But it doesn't. So if we kind of ignore that last chapter and look at Daniel and see what the author is actually saying, it'll be really surprising and it'll give us a lot of answers. So let's start out by looking at this first chapter just to give you an idea of how it works. So here's the first chapter and it just starts off. I'm just going to read a little bit of it. This chart is something I put in there just so we can see. But it says it was 1,600 and 56 years from Adam's creation to Noah's flood. And we can do that. That's why I put this in here. Genesis 5, Adam was 130 when Seth was born. Seth was 105 when Enos was born. Enos was 90 when Canaan was born. And it goes on down, Lamech, and then Noah. And in Genesis 8, it says it was in the 600th year of Noah's life that um, the flood occurred. 
Now, a lot of people look at this and say, well, yeah, but you could it's give or take a year for each one of these. So we could theoretically be five or 10 years off. This is not an accurate way of doing anything. The thing that we, we are forgetting is that according to Essene doctrine, if the Essenes are right, they have a calendar. And this is simply the way of talking about it. It was in the 600 year of Noah's life. Noah was born in a certain year and in his 600th year in that same year or the time period. So if I was born in 1965 in my 50th year, it's, it's going to overlap two years because I'm not born right on January 1st, you know. But it's going to be taken into account. It's going to be based on the calendar. Why they didn't use the calendar, I don't know. I mean, there's speculation on maybe that's just the way it was written. Maybe the rabbis decided they didn't want you to know how to figure the calendar. Lots of possibilities on that. Anyway, so we come up with the same one. We've looked at this many times. Um, so, like, if you go to our, um, uh, let's see, Ona studies here, and if you go to the third Ona, that would be from, um, oh, okay, I need to go to the fourth. So, the fourth Ona. So, from 1500 to 2000, in that particular time period, we run down here and we see, here is the flood, 1656 AM, which is 2270 BC. It was in the first right it was the next to the last year of the first shemitah of the fourth jubilee of that fourth one so all the time periods all the different manuscripts all the different calendars concur on that so that's what he's saying that's the first verse okay so then he kind of pulls some things together he said enoch buried adam that's an interesting tidbit we didn't know about he buried Adam and then lived another 57 years and was raptured. Now, you can go back and you can look these up and find out when he was born, when he was raptured, when he was born, plus 365, uh, and subtract um, Adam lived to be 930, so subtract 930 from it. It'll come out to be 57, so very accurate. So Enoch buried Adam and then lived another 57 years and was raptured. Methuselah died just before Noah's flood. You can figure this up in Genesis 2. It comes out to be the same year as the flood. From other manuscripts, we're told it was exactly one week before the flood. And then, of course, in Genesis, we're told that God shut the door to the ark exactly one week before the flood. So what has to have occurred is that they buried Methuselah, entered the ark all on the same day that afternoon, bury him in the morning, that afternoon they enter the ark, and God himself shuts the door. So lots of interesting information when you start looking at dates and, and things like this. Okay, then it goes on and says it was 340 years from the flood to the division of languages. That's when the Tower of Babel fell and the languages were all divided. Noah lived 10 years past the division of the languages. And our father Abraham was 48 years old at the division of languages. And you can go back and some of these you can calculate with Genesis and some of them you can't. But all the ones that you can calculate are perfect with this. Now, we get here. This is our first introduction, first chapter. There's this guy named Rabbi Yoshi. And he's our culprit. He's our main culprit in this investigation. But he makes a comment. He says, Eber was such a great prophet that he called his son Peleg. Peleg means earthquake. And in Genesis 10, it says, for in his days, the earth was divided. Well, good, good point. Okay. We'll come back to this rabbi in a little bit. So this is interesting how it, um, let's see, talks about the 13 families of Jockton. So let's just look at a couple of other things here. Our father Abraham was 70 years old. When God spoke to him at the covenant between the pieces, that's one thing you probably can't absolutely pinpoint just using Genesis. It's in there. It's Genesis 12 and, and 15, but it's it should be about 70, 75, something like that. Um, and Jasher, I think, kind of explains the, the numbers on that, but they tend to agree. And it was written, and this is Exodus 20 or 1241, 
At the end of 430 years, even the self same day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So, after God spoke to Abraham, he returned to Haran and stayed there five years. What he's basically saying here is Abraham was 70 years old, and we've done this before. If the flood is 1656, you tally up the years to Noah's birth, and that's 1948 a.m., plus 70 years, plus 430 years to the day, which would be Nisan 15, is when the Exodus happened. So you can date the Exodus 2,448 years after creation. So it goes on and says, it is written, this quote from Genesis 12, Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. This is when he goes to permanently settle in um, the land of Canaan, which will become his land. So it was 26 years from the dispersion at the fall of the Tower of Babel to the time Abraham left Haran. So again, he's He's trying several different things to show you. If, you. if you can get two or three timelines running at the same time and the different things stack up together, that's pretty straightforward. So that's a way to absolutely prove something like this. So then he says it was written, 12 years they served, we're talking about, um, yeah, he doesn't really mention it, but uh, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adama, Zeboim, and Zor. Twelve years they served Kedoliomer, and in the thirteenth they rebelled, and in the fourteenth year came Kedoliomer. So again, he comes down there, settles. Uh, he doesn't directly connect this for sure, but then there's twelve years, thirteen, fourteen, and then things happen. So the year of the famine was the same year in which Abraham left Haran. So there's a famine. And it's the same famine connected with Sodom and Gomorrah. So he's connecting Abraham leaving at a certain date with the 12 years. And then 13, 14 is the war. So we can tally all those up. So he migrated to Egypt and stayed there three months. Then he returned and settled in the plain of Mamre in Hebron. That was the same year that he conquered the five kings. And he lived there 10 years before he married Hagar. So lots and lots of dates. So in other words, what we're talking about, you remember the story in Genesis. He, he's not going to get into the war, not his problem. But then Lot, his nephew's captured. That's different. So then he takes his 318 servants, arms them. They go after Kedileomer's army. They annihilate them. And he personally kills Kedileomer, brings everybody back. I mean, that's the only way you can guarantee there's not going to be a revolt again. You've got to destroy the entire army. And so he does that. And that's when Melchizedek knows that he's the one to fulfill the prophecy. Because that just crippled well over a third of the Babylonian Empire. Which is what he's prophesied to destroy. So single-handedly in one couple of days there. So Melchizedek comes to bless him. And that's the story in Genesis 14. Uh, it is written... Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So again, you can tally these up. Abraham was four score and six years old when Hagar bore Ishmael. And those are just quotes out of Genesis. Ishmael was 14 years older than Isaac. It was 52 years from the fall of the Tower of Babel to the birth of Isaac. Sodom was settled a total of 52 years, although it's, it and its sister cities lived only 26 years in peace and quiet. It was a total of 392 years from the flood to the birth of Isaac. So we're adding all these up. So since he said this, I go ahead and put in this little chart. This is from Genesis 11. This gets us from uh, our Faxid, which is born two years after the flood, Shem's son all the way down to Terah, and then you get Abraham. So it is written in Genesis 11, these are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begot her Faxed two years after the flood. And anyway, we could go on down, and there's a lot more in here. But I wanted to show you, uh, there's about Hebron and the Philistines and Sarah, um, 
Abraham buried his father, Terah, two years before Sarah died. Methuselah learned, oh, now this is the one I wanted to show you here. This is interesting. These last two paragraphs of chapter one. So Methuselah, let me see if I can do this here. Not quite, okay. Methuselah learned directly from Adam. Now just think about this for a minute. Methuselah learned directly from Adam since he was born 243 years before Adam's death. Shem learned directly from Methuselah since he was born 98 years before Methuselah's death. And of course, Shem outlives Noah. He goes all the way through the, the flood and into our time period. Jacob learned directly from Shem since he was born 50 years before Shem's death. And we have records of him, you know, studying in Shem's yeshiva. Jacob's birth was also 16 years before Abraham died. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. These four men lived through 22 generations. A total of seven men were eyewitnesses of the entire world and each other. These seven are Adam, Methuselah, Shem, Jacob, Amram, that's Moses' dad, Ahijah of Shiloh, one of our missing books we're trying to find, uh, or the guy that wrote it, the author, Elijah the prophet, and Elijah is still living. Isn't that amazing? So this is the kind of thing that's in the Seder, and it's just, you know, some things you can't, absolutely prove from scripture again what you can the numbers add up so he goes through again let me run back up to the top here so we just looked mainly at, at most of that first create uh, first chapter creation to jacob so he goes through all of these things and tallies them up through the judges samuel david solomon uh, ahijah all the way the prophets uh destruction of samaria hezekiah Ezekiel, the fall of Jerusalem, okay, and then Daniel. So the fall of Jerusalem we know to be um, 586 or 587 BC when the temple was destroyed. Uh, the, the Babylonian captivity has started, and then in 536 BC we have the uh, Cyrus decreeing the Jews to go free. And then, but while we're in that time period, you have Daniel the prophet writing. So now I want to take some time and look at chapter 28, and we're going to see how some things got tampered with. So again, what we're trying to see here is going back to here, why is the date 5946 instead of 5782? How did that happen? The Seder explains it. So let's go to Daniel. So again, the Babylonian captivity has happened. They've been taken to Babylon. The temple's been destroyed. Daniel the prophet is reigning. So he starts out, we'll skip a little bit of this, but in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream. And we see that from Daniel 2. And it was in the 5 and 20th day of the month, on the 12th month. And this is when a certain thing happened. And he goes through and gives some other days. So first off, these two seem to contradict. And he gives you the, the example here of why does one verse say it was the 25th day and the other verse say it's the 27th. So they both got the years right, but why are we off two days? It was on the 25th that Nebuchadnezzar died and was buried. And on the 26th, evil Mitradek had him dug up and drugged through the streets, which is another prophecy. This was the custom to show people that all of Nebuchadnezzar's decrees were annulled at death. So again, there he's trying, be it right or wrong, he's trying to explain the discrepancies. And they can't really be unproven, I suppose. So this was fulfilled, the prophecy of Isaiah. And then, let's see, let's just go on down here. So Nebuchadnezzar reigned 45 years Evil Mitridek, that'd be his, his son, reigned after his father, Nebuchadnezzar, 23 years. And then Belshazzar reigned after his father, Evil Mitridek, three years. 
Now, this is a problem or was a problem for a while because we dug up some uh, Babylonian documents that seem to indicate there were probably about five people from Nebuchadnezzar to its fall. Um, and what has happened is uh, at some of these time periods, other people were ruling, some people were left in charge, that kind of stuff. But later on, we found other records, and this is one such record, uh, and, and we go by scripture. And the scripture indicates that there would be three generations. So Nebuchadnezzar, one, two, three, and then it falls. So Nebuchadnezzar, Mitradach, and then Belshazzar. And in, when he's there, that's when Darius takes Darius and Cyrus, you know, take the kingdom. And so he goes on and pulls out dates from Daniel. The first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, had a dream. So let me run back here real quick, just to check, make sure we're still broadcasting. Okay, it looks like we are. Okay. Somebody said there was a problem. Let me get back to here. Okay, so um, let's see here. And this is when they when they fell. And he begins to talk about the prophecies of those. So let's see here. Um, then we get into this. This is the important part because all of the old manuscripts have the exact same dates up to the fall of Nebuchadnezzar Babylon and the beginning of the Persian Empire. Somehow, the time period of the Persian Empire has been reduced in some manuscripts from 200 years to about 20. And then some other numbers have been moved around. And so that's what we're seeing in some of them. So this is what he says. So this is the important part. Why does this verse mention that Darius was 62 years old? So and this is Daniel 5, 31. That night Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain. Darius the Mede took the kingdom, being about threescore and two years old. So why is that important? Why does the scripture mention he was 62? This shows that on that day, or on the day that Nebuchadnezzar entered the temple of the Lord, and that's when uh, Jehoiachin was reigning in Judah, and his arch, at that very day, his arch enemy Darius was born. So it's an interesting setup. This night, Belshazzar died. Darius took the kingdom. It was exactly 70 years after Nebuchadnezzar became king of Babylon and 69 years after he conquered Jehoiakim. So he's explaining this. That's why the 62 is very important. So we can solidify this group. And that agrees with scripture. So, so far we're still okay. So then in Daniel 9, it says it was the first year of Darius, the son of Hashuerus, of the seed of the Medes, when Daniel has the vision. And this is the prophecy about the coming of Messiah, Daniel chapter 9, the 70 weeks from the time of the decree to the time Messiah is cut off. Okay, but now look at what happens. Here's the deal. Uh, I also, Daniel, uh, verse of chapter 11, verse 2, the angel's talking to Daniel. In the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him, and now I will show you the truth. Behold, there shall yet stand up three kings in Persia. This is very important for us to calculate. The fourth shall be far richer than they are, and his strength through his riches he will stir up the realm of Greece. That's the prophecy. So then he begins to tell us, and, and you can just go look this up in any history book, and it's the same. The three rulers that come after Darius before the Persians fall, because they fall to the Greeks, and then the, there's the Romans. So the three rulers that come after Darius are Cyrus, and that's that's what is mentioned in the text. It should be Cambyses, Cyrus's son, is what actually what we're talking about. And then Ahasuerus which was Smyrtus, and Darius I, who built a temple. The fourth, who is by far richer than all of them, is the king of Media. So here is what we have, the basic dates. You can pull these out of, this, this was taken, I'm not sure why I picked the NIV study Bible, but out of a study Bible. Here's the approximate dates, 536 or 537 BC, 
down to 480 when Xerxes attacks Greece. And this gets a guy by the name of Alexander pretty mad. And we know the rest of the story. Alexander conquers the kingdom. So Cambyses, Pseudosmyrtus, Darius, and Xerxes. Those are the four prophesied. Now, look at this, 536 to 480. That, that's a good number of years, right? Now, this says, uh, Daniel continued even to the first year of the king Cyrus, which is Daniel 121. So at this time, the archangel Gabriel said to Daniel, at the beginning of your supplications, the commandment came forth, and I've now come to show you. Now, just notice this. He's quoting scripture. I want you to look at this really closely. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So know, therefore, and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. The street will be built again, the wall, even in troublesome times. After the three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And then the prince comes and he quotes all the rest of the chapter. Now, the reason why this is kind of important is because a lot of Jewish manuscripts, commentaries will tell you this is a Messiah and a Messiah or just Messiah. It's some anointed guy. Maybe it was Cyrus. Maybe it's someone else. But the reason this, and he's, he's going to explain this here in a minute. This is, look, look at the footnote here on this, basically. And you can't see this. I should have had the text in there. But the Hebrew actually has... And basically, it's a word and then another word, and there's a line at the top, kind of like we have a dash, like uh, dark green apple. It might be dark dash green as a hyphenated descriptive word, dark green apple. This is, uh, when you do that, it shows the words are connected. Okay, well, they don't use a dash in the middle of a word, but they have a kind of a dash at the top. And this is called Semitic construct state influence. And it means the words are connected. So here's the point. You don't say from this time to when a Messiah comes. If it's connected, it's the same thing as putting an H in front of it, Ha Messiah. A lot of people will argue it should be uh, Ha Mashiach if it's the Messiah. And this is just Mashiach. So it's just a guy. Well, it's... You've got a dash at the top, so you don't need the H, okay? So it's it's very, very straightforward. So he's saying here that it is the Messiah. So the prophecy is, from the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah is so many weeks. And, and we know that, and we, we understand that, we got that then. But now here's this Rabbi Yoshi again. We talked about him in the first chapter. Now, Understand this. This guy is trying to be very respectful to all of his elders and say, with all due respect, you know you're lying. I'm just saying. Here's all the stories, all the tallies, all the numbers. Everybody agrees on them. It comes out to be 536 BC. And then there's four kings, and you can calculate that. Alexander comes in. Uh, 323 BC, and then there's the stuff that happens in Daniel, and you can date those pretty well. So he says this. Now, this Rabbi Yoshi says the following. The 70 weeks, and we know what those are. That's from the decree. 69 of it is when Messiah is cut off, and then there's that last 70th week, which has not happened yet, because in between the, the 69 and that last week, there is the uh, death of the Messiah, the birth of the church, the destruction of the temple, the dispersion of Israel. And then Israel has to come back again. So that's 32 AD, 70 AD, 135 AD. And then Israel has to come back. That was 1948. They have to capture the Temple Mount. That was 1967. Then they have to build a temple. That hasn't happened yet. Then they have to start up sacrifices again for somebody, this Antichrist figure, 
to go into the temple and stop the sacrifices. You can't stop them right now. There aren't any. That makes sense. And you've got all these other things in between. So we know what that means. But Rabbi Yoshi said, the 70 weeks are figured from the destruction of the first temple. What's that got to do with anything? To the destruction of the second temple. So there's 490 years, basically, through, you know, uh, the 70 weeks, which should be from 606 BC to 70 AD. That doesn't fit. But you, I suppose you could kind of tweak it there just a little bit. Again, they're trying to change the dating system. Okay. The seven took place. This is this is his theory. So the 70 weeks are not from the, the command to rebuild the temple to the Messiah, but it's from the destruction of the first temple 70 years earlier to the destruction of the second temple 40 years later. So that's 100 or 70, let's see, 70 and 40. That's 100 and 130 years right there. The, this is his first theory in tweaking the numbers. So the first temple to the second temple. The seven, seven years, took place while they were still in Babylonian exile. Doesn't make sense. Anyway, then one week took place while they were moving back into the land. Finally, there were 62 weeks from that point to the destruction of the second temple. That didn't fit either. It just doesn't fit. Okay. So then Rabbi Yoshi said, it just didn't fit with anything they had, so he changed his story. New theory. He said, oh, okay, it was 70 years between the destruction of the first temple to the dedication of the second temple. So, and then we add the 410. He says 410. It should be 420 if, if it even halfway fit. But either way, 410, 420. Add those number of years, and we come to the 490 years of the prophecy which ended at the destruction of the second temple. Closer doesn't fit, though. So looking at this, this is what's really interesting. If we come down here, these are the actual uh, dates, AM, Babylonian kingdom, the Persian kingdom, and Daniel's prophecies, and they all fit perfectly. So this is an example of Yoshi's two theories the two theories don't mesh. So it's like one set of dates, one set of dates, and then what the angel Gabriel said in Daniel. I think I'm going to go with what Gabriel said. So neither of his theories could be correct because they both contradict the angel Gabriel. What he clearly says in the prophecy begins with the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. So that date, 445 BC, we can get that give or take a year, whatever, but that date. So the prophecy starts then, okay? Then uh, this event began the 70 weeks, has nothing to do with the temple. Next, the Messiah would die and the temple would be destroyed. Messiah died in 32, temple was destroyed in 70. Then the final week occurs. That's what it clearly says in the text. The city and the sanctuary are destroyed. Then... A prince comes, you know, this, um, then the final week occurs. Okay. So this theory of Rabbi Yoshi is simply his way of not having to deal with the fact the Messiah has already come. Notice how each time an error occurs, the Seder gives the scripture to correctly order the conduct and to contradict the heretical teaching of the apostate rabbis. So this is, we can look at this. So his first theory is, the 70 year captivity, that's from 607. Just look at the top one here 607 BC to 537 BC. That's give or take a year, correct? That's that is 70 years. So he's going to say seven weeks are in here. One week is in the middle. That would take us from 537 to 530. Okay, that's fine. And then the 62 weeks would occur. That would get us to 96 BC. Was the temple destroyed in 96 BC? No, it doesn't fit. Whether you like Messiah or not, it, one plus one is not five. 
Uh, it's 32 AD. It's actually 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. So quite a bit more, almost 200 years off that time. So looking at Rabbi Yoshi's first theory, we can see three errors. There were 50 years, not 49, in the 70 weeks from the destruction of the first temple to the decree of Cyrus. There were seven years, one week. It comes after the Messiah, not before. And there's 430, or, yeah, 434 years, the 62 weeks. It would end at 96 BC, and which misses the Messiah's death by 38 years. Um, and misses the destruction of the second temple by at least 74. Seems like I got those numbers switched around. Maybe I have errors in this. Okay, so looking at Rabbi Yoshi's second theory, we see two things. 70 plus 410 is 480, not 490. Using either set of numbers would come to either 56 BC or 46 BC. Still far away from the date of the destruction of the second temple. And here's a diagram, again, 444 BC, 7 weeks, 395, 62 weeks, it's 32 AD, when Messiah dies, one week in the future. So this is what the Archangel Gabriel teaches. So again, looking carefully at Gabriel's prophecy, we see the 70 weeks start with a command to rebuild the city. The decree was given by Artaxerxes to Nehemiah. This is recorded in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. And in chapter 13, verse 6, it's 444 BC. And then we go on to, and we've talked about this before, but this goes on and describes how Julius Africanus, one of the church fathers, calculates how to properly uh, put their prophetic weeks on the Roman calendar so we can get up with that. And it ends up coming out to be, and this was reproduced by a guy named Sir Robert Anderson a um, hundred and some years ago, I think. Anyway, so it puts all this stuff together. So we get this, and here's the basic stuff. So it comes out to be April 6th, 32 AD, is when Messiah should die. After that, we have a 70 week, or I mean a seventh, a 70th final week, one week, seven years. Um, and here's a whole bunch of quotes. We put this in here just to show you. Most Jews today are going to say that, you know, Messiah never came. Well, here's what some of the guys said, some of the best rabbis ever way back when. Here's Maimonides. says, Daniel has alluded to us the knowledge of the end times. However, since they are secret, the wise rabbis have barred the calculation of the days of Messiah's coming so that the untutored populace, I guess Christian believers, will not be led astray when they see that the end times have already come but there was no sign of a Messiah. Well, yeah, that, that would be very disheartening. You set a date, Messiah doesn't come. Then I think the whole thing's a bunch of hooey. Uh, no, Messiah did come. So it's what Maimonides said. So he says there's actually a rabbinic curse. You're not supposed to read Daniel 9, get out a calendar and a calculator. It is actually that simple. You know, so many days is so many days, but you're not supposed to do that. Because people will get upset thinking the date should have been 32 AD and Messiah didn't come. Actually, what he's saying is you're going to say, okay, Messiah didn't come. Wait a minute, 32 AD? That sounds familiar. Where have I heard that date before? Oh, yeah, Christianity. Then you're going to start thinking, that does fit. I mean, I wonder, I wonder. And you're going to get people starting to study the scriptures. So here's another a uh, quote of Maimonides. The anointed king is destined to stand up and restore the Davidic kingdom to its antiquity. Um, let's see here. It talks about jubilees and precepts. Okay. Whoever, he, he comes and he changes things. Whoever does not believe in him or whoever does not wait for his coming not only defies the prophets, but also the Torah and Moses, our teacher. Bar Kokhba claimed that he was Messiah. That's the guy that did the rebellion in 130 AD, tried to start Israel back again. He and all the sages of his generation deemed him to be King Messiah, but he was until he was killed by his own sins. 
Since he was killed, we know now that Bar Kokhba was not the Messiah. Christians could have told you that. Rabbi Juna, a Judah from the Talmud says this, These times, that 70-week time when the Messiah comes, were over long ago. Yeah, they were, and you missed your Messiah. Rabbi uh, Moses Avraham Levi says, I have examined and searched the Holy Scriptures and have not found the time of the Messiah clearly fixed except the words of Gabriel the prophet to Daniel, which are written in the ninth chapter of the prophecy of Daniel. The time of Messiah's coming is clearly fixed in that chapter. Oh, by the way, don't read that. You might get confused. Another quote from Maimonides. One should not try to calculate the appointed time of the coming of the Messiah from Daniel 9. Our sages declared, and this is a quote from Sanhedrin 97b, may the spirits of those who attempt to calculate the final time of Messiah's coming expire. That's a rabbinical curse. May you die if you read Daniel 9. Rather, one should await his coming and believe in the general conception of the matter, as we have explained. No, thank you. Uh, another quote from the Talmud. We all, we need to do teshiva, which is good deeds. You can't sacrifice animals anymore, so you just got to help the poor and works, work your way to heaven, that kind of stuff. We just need to do teshuva until Messiah actually comes. For all the predestined dates for the redemption have already passed. Well, yeah, he came. Another another uh, quote from Rabbi from a Rabbi of the Talmud: The time limits for redemption have passed. The matter now depends only on repentance and good deeds. They have nothing else to say. I mean, the date was set in stone, and it didn't happen in their mind because it wasn't Jesus. If it wasn't Jesus, who was it? If it wasn't Jesus, he didn't come. Uh, temple miracles, just a couple more, and then we'll kind of stop for tonight. But it's interesting. Um, in the Talmud, they talk about certain miracles that happened about 40 years before the destruction of the temple. Now, why would miracles just stop happening approximately 40 years before the destruction of the temple? Well, what happened 40 years before the destruction of the temple? 70 minus 40 is 30. So around about 30 AD, let's just say 32 AD, the Messiah dies, fulfilling prophecy. That would make sense that certain prophecies or certain miracles might stop. If they were ever going to, that would be the time it would happen. So here's just a couple of quotes. Uh, Rosh Hashanah 31b, the lot for the scapegoat, you know, sacrificed, uh, ceased to come to the hand of the high priest as previously. The crimson cloth put on Yom Kippur would not turn white as it did before. The rabbi said they, they take the uh, scarlet cloth tied to the horn of the scapegoat, the Azazel goat, and then once the ritual is over and he's killed, that red cord turns white. The Mikanur doors would open and close by themselves. And the angel would trouble the water. There's a whole bunch of little things that happen that are just miracles. Uh, and here's another one. The Western light would not keep burning as before, and the doors of the temple would no longer open by themselves. Those are all miracles that supposedly happen. I don't know if they did or not, but they're recorded as happening. But the interesting thing about it, the people that reject Messiah say that for some unknown reason, it happens 40 years before the destruction of the temple. So that to me is a very powerful argument. So these kind of things are the things we need to be aware of and talk about. So to pull this together, then we have something called the Seder Alam. The Seder Alam is a history book. The Talmud of the Jews quote the Seder Alam, say it's accurate history, and a lot of their stuff either agrees with or is based on the Seder Alam, because the Talmud comes out a couple hundred years after this is written. In this scroll, however, it clearly says, and it gives you all the calculations, we read most of chapter 1, gives you all the calculations down to Daniel and Ezra and Esther. This last chapter, whatever was there, has been so highly edited, 
even what they have is smudged out, written, smudged out, written. Somebody, can we say Rabbi Yoshi, is changing dates. Just saying. So we have this. So when you go back and you look at this, it's kind of in between the 160 some years. So both of Rabbi Yoshi's theories flat do not fit. And we didn't read it. There's another chapter in here that talks about uh, the Persian kingdoms. I think it's in Ezra and Esther. It might be in there. Let me see if I can find it real quick. It's an interesting. Uh, the feast. The Persian kings. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this part here, he talks about how the Jews were in captivity in Babylon for 52 years before they were freed by Cyrus. Um, that's, that's not when the first wave had happened, but the destruction of the temple. Okay, Cyrus continued his reign after he conquered Babylon for three years. Ahasuerus ruled for 14, followed by Darius. In the second year of the reign of Darius, the temple was rebuilt. Yeah, but there were two Dariuses. I mean, basically, you're trying to take the 200 and some years and run it down to 20. So here is what Daniel 11 and Ezra has with Cyrus, Darius, Cambyses, Pseudosmeris, and Darius. We get 20 years, and he's doing this co-rule to 20 years. So there's an interesting thing going on here. And then he goes on and talks about the other rules. And, okay. Anyway, we'll stop there at this point. But basically, we're shrinking it down. So Rabbi Yoshi comes up with two different theories, changing the timeline from here to here or to here. Neither one fit, and neither one are our missing 160-some uh, years. But what happens is Rabbi Yoshi is rejected both times because it flat doesn't fit. Somebody else has to come up with other ideas. One of the other ideas is that um, Cyrus Hashuerus is the one with Esther the king with Esther. Darius the first built it, or Darius the second actually built the temple, but um, Cyrus is the other one. So what they're going to say, one of the theories is they come up with is that Cyrus, Ahasuerus, and Darius are titles. You know, like king, uh, god, prince, ruler, president, different words like that from different dialects. And in reality, these are the same guy. So that's one, one way how they can get the 200 and some years down to 20. But then when they do that, you've got to somehow add years and do other things because you can't take that much out. So again, what, what is happening then is that we go to here. We change the date then from 5946 to 5782, the missing 160 some years. And so it's interesting to me that we have a rabbinic writing that the Talmud actually says is a good deal. And we all agree on all of the dates in there, all the way up to the Persian period, when all of a sudden 200 and some years becomes 20. And then the prophecy about from the building of the temple to the Messiah becomes from the destruction of the older one to the destruction of the newer one. But then we have to shrink that down too. So somebody's really tweaking stuff. So just wanted to let you know that. So there is a document that is rabbinic that tells us that somebody changed the numbers. Um, and maybe you could be nice and say maybe Rabbi Yoshi didn't do it specifically to reject Messiah. I don't know why else he would do it, but that's basically what happened. And the writer of this thing agrees. He uses the um, Semitic construct state influence in the text, just like Daniel does. So you have to translate it until the Messiah comes. It's not just an anointed person. So don't let people tell you that. They'll tell you there's no, it's not HaMashiach, there's no the in there. No, but it is in the, in the state. There's a dash or at the top. 